You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Have you ever wondered, you know, my mortgage payment is pretty big. If I had that money every month, my lifestyle would be better. I could put some away for retirement. I could buy cool stuff that I don't need. I could, you know, buy my kids something I really want that I shouldn't, but I could. I'd be that parent, buy my wife, my girlfriend, whatever, just something really epic. Yeah, just a bunch of crap if I just didn't have to make my mortgage payment. So when you're making that mortgage payment, do you ever think to yourself, no, if I didn't make that, that mortgage payment, how long could I live in my house before I got booted out? Now, you know, during the Great Recession, we all kind of learned that you could probably live a really long time. It's a stressful way to live. But today's story, Long Island man dodges eviction for 20 years, living in a house he doesn't own. And it's got a Seattle real estate connection. So you got to stay tuned. Find out what that is. That's what we're talking about today. Before we dive on in, if you're new here, my name is Sean Reynolds. I own a couple of side hustle real estate companies. But what I really like to do and what people tune in to hear is real estate guy reading the news. Let's jump on in. Let's do this. Okay, so Long Island, guy buys a house in the late 90s, makes one payment still there. How does that work, you think? Okay. I mean, you got you got to dig deep in order to make this happen. You've got to you've got to really be able to go the full distance, dig deep all of those sports metaphors, right? Just stay hang in the pocket. You're going to have to take hit after hit. Cuz these lenders, hey, we own this place and you're living in it, and you're not making any payments. 20 years this guy manages to stay there. I'm reading this just because I'm impressed. It's like, okay, you're a total scumbag for putting all these people who own your home, all these lenders, for, you signed a contract, you didn't fulfill it, now you're just putting them through the ringer. You're a jerk. But let's, let, let's see what that looks like. A Long Island man who only ever made one mortgage payment has deftly used the courts to stay in the house for 23 years for free, according to legal papers. I'm going to butcher his name. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. So um, person that doesn't make your mortgage payments for 23 years, apologize in advance. Guramrit Hanspal, 52, hey, he's my age, imagine that, has filed four lawsuits and claimed bankruptcy, get this, seven times. How does a bankruptcy court, all right, this is number six bankruptcy in 10 years or 15 years. Yeah, well, do better next time and you need to probably get some credit counseling and you should do some stuff-ish. Seven times, bankruptcy. So how does that happen? If that were a corporation, a judge would be like on the second time, mm, no, we're not granting you this bankruptcy. Seven times to avoid being booted from the 2081 square foot East Meadow home. He, and I love this in quote quotes, bought for $290,000 in 1998. So far, it's worked. Two different banks and a real estate company have owned the three bedroom, two and a half bath home since Hans Ball was forced, uh, was foreclosed upon in 2000. But Hans Ball remains. Hans Ball is not the only occupant of the home leveraging the US bankruptcy codes automatic stay rules, which give debtors a temporary retrieve from all collection efforts, harassment and foreclosures. Normally, I'd say, yeah, and, and during the Great Recession, there was a lot of shady stuff going on leading up to that. I mean, we had we had loans going on just kind of whipping around us. We would do appraisals on stuff and you're like, huh, this doesn't make any sense at all. You know, you've got the, the what was it, the big short in that movie where you've literally got strippers with three or four homes because they got a lot of cash, they've got the cash for the down payment, get a low interest rate, get a tenant in there, whatever, you make it go. You know, you've got, um, you got tradespeople, we had plumbers, electricians, and there's nothing against, I'm not saying these people don't make a lot of money, but you've guys, you had guys literally on the ground, guys that make 60, 70 grand buying a $1.2 million home because you had a teaser rate, an introductory teaser rate for one year. So if you could get done what you needed to in that one year, get the home fixed up, refinanced, whatever you're golden. If you couldn't do that, you were hosed. And that is when the, you know, the big short happened because uh, things went sideways and all those values started dropping and the house of cards just blew up. 
So at least three other people listing the home at 2468 Kenmore Street as their address have also filed for bankruptcy in Brooklyn Federal Court, winning the automatic stay only two only to have the claims eventually dismissed court record show. So they're tying this up. And the answer is you can stay in your home for over like 20 years. Imagine, imagine you're eight, you're in there and you're like, wow, I've had a pretty good run there. And then you envision yourself in 12 years from that. So this guy literally bought this in his early 30s and he's still there in his 50s. That is fun. That is a phenomenal abuse of the system. But you know what? Hats off to him because that takes some staying power. I admire your ability to hang in there and take the beat down because what you put your credit through, what you put the other people in your life through, we're going to get evicted today. Yeah, I don't know. It's our seventh stay. Uh, we had to file bankruptcy again. Uh, how's our credit? Oh, not good. But we're still in the house. I mean, just just the rigmarole this guy had to go through and probably put his family through to make this go. But if your if your end game was let's see how long we can avoid eviction, this guy's a winner, right? It's really a group of people that are more than willing to use the courts and abuse the courts to whatever extent they needed to extend their illegal occupancy," said Attorney Jordan Katz, who uh, reps current property owner Diamond Ridge Partners. So. You've got multiple lenders who have owned this. And so what happens is somebody goes through a foreclosure, it gets foreclosed on. That mortgage typically gets, you know, sold down the line to some, you know, high risk uh, mortgage lender because, you know, uh, big traditional mortgage lenders, they don't take mortgages from people that have had foreclosures. They don't. That's a high risk asset class, right? Once you've gone down that 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 bankruptcy or that uh, you know foreclosure deal, you're in a different category. You're playing in a different ball game, and so traditional lenders they won't touch it with a ten foot pole. So your you know your mortgage gets sold a bunch, and it's just a bunch of you know who owns my mortgage now or who who owned my mortgage or wh who's owns the house. You don't know a lot of that out there, especially in the Great Recession where these homes, you know. Their bank, uh, lenders were going sideways at the same time borrowers were, and it was just a bloodbath. Hansball's history of litigation is incredibly long and sordid, said Katz, who added that while he's seen occupants staying in foreclosed homes before, nothing even approach, pr approaches the length of this one. I've never heard of it. I read this article and then a handful of you guys sent this to me and I was like, yeah, I, I need to read this just, just on principle alone. He's not legally occupying that property, Kat said. All right, that's a, that's a true statement. It's an outrage. It is. And a good deal. All right, let's, let's approach it from that standpoint. Hans Ball, who had an initial 7.375% interest rate, 1998, remember? So a little, little over seven and a quarter, seven and uh, huh, three eighths, something like that. Seven, three eighths uh, percent interest rate on the 232,000 adjustable rate mortgage. So he had an arm. Those were, those were given out like candy in the nineties, right? He likely saved himself upwards of $440,000 by not paying his bills. Okay. All right. Almost a half million dollars. You start to rethink your strategy at that point in time, don't you? Well, if I tie up this house and if I don't make a payment, I'm going to have to go banco. My credit's just going to be crappy. But if I had $440,000 over the course of this, mm, that, that's a lot of money. You never want to think that way. Just do things the right way. You'll sleep better at, at night. You don't have to worry. Is the uh, is the lender going to come today and take the house away? Is the sheriff department coming? Are we going to get that notice on our house again? Not a good way to live. Not a good way to live. Live on the take the take the higher path. Right? Just just do. It's easier. Hanswell got the money from Washington Mutual in 1998 and made exactly one payment. $1,602.37 before defaulting, prompting the bank to begin foreclosure proceedings a year later, court records show. Washington Mutual, Seattle-based bank, poster child for the Great Recession. Let me tell you a little background on Washington Mutual from my perspective. So I was doing a ton of appraising back then in the 90s. In the early 90s, I was kind of really ramping up 
um, mid nineties, I was going, we were going, we were putting out a lot of appraisals. So I dealt with Washington mutual a lot. Washington mutual do a lot of jumbo lending that other lenders wouldn't do, but they had this appraisal review department that was annoying. They came up with stuff and sometimes they were right. Oftentimes they're just kind of putting you through the grinder so that by the time the appraisal and the package got into, uh, you know, final underwriting and had a bunch of boxes checked and yeah, we, we made the appraiser do some stuff. We think this property is okay. The Washington Mutual would hassle us more. Their appraisal department would hassle us more than anybody else. And so I ended up getting in arguments with representatives about, yeah, I just don't recommend that loan officers on specific properties deal with you guys. That didn't go over well. But I've always kind of done my own thing and told people what I thought. It doesn't never made me popular. Uh, yeah, John, John will give you a real value. But um, yeah, he's not gonna. He's not gonna do what you tell him to do. <laughs> but um, you know, a lot of people used me and used Reynolds and Klein that wanted to have an accurate of value. And my appraisals would always go through because I wasn't, I wasn't screwing around with anything. So my appraisals were always pretty solid. I could push it up to that edge of believability, which every property has a value range, you got a low to a high. Can you get it up to that high and have it go through underwriting? That is the art of the deal in appraising, right? It's got to be believable. And you got to be able to have that your name go out there time after time after time, years and years, people see your name on that appraisal. And then eventually, they just go, yep, he's good. Check next. Don't even look at it. And that's kind of how my career went. After a while, people are like, yeah, all right, next. Um, so Washington Mutual, they started off pretty responsible. And then they started doing 2055 appraisals, ordering 2055s. That's when we knew that their risk, your propensity for risk had increased, meaning they're you're having an appraiser go out and just doing an exterior appraisal of these properties because they were doing so many HELOCs, so, so many lines of credit, and so much lending. Washington Mutual started lending on everything, everything. And that's when we kind of realized, oh, what what are we doing here? Residential lending was just, it was nuts. We had We had interest rates coming down down, 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 down. We had we had just a downward period of for so many years. And so we'd have these sequences of refinance booms that would just wave after wave after wave. I remember one period, my kids were really little, I worked every day straight for I think 18 months, something like that, where you just get on a, on a routine of you just no time off, no weekends off. Weekends were for writing up the reports that you'd seen earlier in the week nightmare, but you did what you got to do and you made some good money and, you know, hopefully you invested and kind of furthered your career along and, um, you know, stuff that your ex-wife gets down the road, but that's life, right? So Washington Mutual had a lot of ex exposure with Washington Mutual. They were the poster child that went under, they handed out at the end of their lending, they handed out loans like candy, candy, just you want a loan, you got a pulse, literally, it was breathe on this mirror. If you have a pulse, we will give you a loan. It was crazy. It was crazy. We're in a totally different lending environment right now. Totally different. Um, but the exuberance in the market right now feels kind of the same. It feels like, oh, this is frothy. So different lending criteria, Washington Mutual. So Washington Mutual making this loan in 1998 does not surprise me. They were taken everything. And I uh, made exactly one payment and then uh, prompted the bank to uh, begin foreclosure proceedings a year later, court records show. Lenders back then, it had been a long time since lenders had dealt with a big spate of foreclosures or for, for you know, short sales and any kind of you know, lending in that period. So lenders are like, Oh, what do, what do we do? What do we do here? We don't want to put this on our books. This is a bad loan. Yeah, just kind of hope that they start making a payment. And you could string people out. Uh, you could string lenders out by making one payment. That was a strategy too. make a payment like every six months, kind of start the clock, you know, resetting. Oh, they, they made one payment. Maybe, maybe they're maybe they're good for another payment within the next year. Yeah, it was just, it was a bloodbath. The, uh, you know, 
during that time period. And this was uh, after 2007, when things really kind of went sideways. By May of 2000, Washington Mutual successfully foreclosed on the home, and Hans Ball was forever barred from any claim to the property according to the judgment of foreclosure, which is typical. But Hans Ball never left. By January 2001, he filed his first bankruptcy claim, record show. He went on to file another in November of 2001, two in 2002, and one in 2003. How do you how do you file? Are are New York laws that much different than the rest of the United States? They must be, because there's no way you're going to be able to file per, personal bankruptcy. 2001, two in 2002. That's three in two years, and then one in 2003. That's four in three years, uh, and counting. Yeah. Oh no no no! He, two two in 2001. So two two, and one. So five within three years. How does that work? I I don't want to know. All right. I, I don't want to know. If bankruptcy filings didn't work, Hans Paul simply went to the state court seeking relief, sometimes acting as his own attorney, according to an August 2005 order from Nassau County Judge Burton S. Joseph. Meanwhile, in 2004, Hans Paul transferred the deed of the home. He, he doesn't even own the home transferred the deed of the home to a friend, Rajender Pal, even though he had no legal right to do so. This is where I, this is where this guy's getting creative. I'm I'm my respect is coming back here. And that's according to court papers. Pal using the Kenmore Street address filed for bankruptcy in 2005, staving off eviction yet again. All right, so you got an illegal transfer of a deed and then that buddy, hey, we're in this together. You need to you need to file bankruptcy. I mean, this is we got to get as many people living in here as possible. We're all going to file bankruptcy. We're just going to live for free. That is literally what they did, right? Mr. Hansbell and Mr. Powell's apparent frivolous conduct in using the court system and the bankruptcy proceeding as a sword to get out of a lawful debt rather than a shield is most disconcerting to this court. Disconcerting. I would be pissed if I was a judge. You've done what? You just basically abuse the legal system, right? Uh, Joe, uh, judge wrote in uh, 2005, threatening sanctions. Well, apparently, there were no sanctions. And apparently, there was no, there was nothing that this guy underwent that basically told him, hey, you can't do this. He just kept getting away with it. By 2008, <laughs> Washington Mutual had gone under. They had gone under. They just, boom, bit the dust. I think, who was the lender that bought, oh, Chase bought their assets. And then another lender came in and bought their hard money assets. Another lender that's not around. There are so many lenders that I dealt with for the first half of my career that just weren't there for the second half. Most of the lenders that are in the residential mortgage industry right now, you haven't heard of a lot of them. It's just they come up, they recycle, they go through. There's a handful still doing business, but a lot of them just make their money, get out, go do something else, whatever. You don't want to have too much exposure to the residential real estate market because things always go sideways eventually. All right. So by 2008, Washington Mutual had gone under, marking one of the largest bank collapses in American history. Too big to fail mm, until it's not. Uh, with its assets eventually taken over by JPM Morgan Chase. And who was that other hard money lender? Uh, it starts with a C, can't remember. Crazy. The new bank was also unable to boot Hans Ball because he's a tricky, slimy guy. Uh, and he's and, and has been locked in litigation with him for years, with Hans Ball filing at least three lawsuits against JPM Morgan Chase in Nassau Supreme Court. The two sides are also in an ongoing legal battle in Brooklyn Federal Court. Hans Ball claims in court papers that Chase committed blatant fraud in 2010 by trying to evict him when it didn't have proper title to the home and accused the bank of withholding surplus funds from a previous auction of the property. See where he's going? He's just taking every single angle he can and working it. So from a standpoint of this guy worked all the angles, I got to take my hat off to him. I mean, crime does pay. It's just at the end of the day, end of the day, you got paid for your crime 
but you might go to jail and you're not a good person. And from that standpoint, I'm a no go on this kind of thing, right? Chase slammed Hansball for clogging the court docket with patently frivolous claims, but it worked, right? By May 2018, Chase unloaded the property to Diamond Ridge, which offered Hansball 20 grand to leave. This guy is just, man, he's working it. Here's 20 grand. Get the F out of our house. Let us take this home back. He didn't take the deal and instead filed for bankruptcy again in 2019 and 2020. Another purported occupant of the home, Boss Shawla, filed bankruptcy four times in 2019, as did another resident allegedly named John Smith, who filed once. There's always seems to be a new occupant who pops up at the last moment, said Diamond Ridge attorney Katz. They never show up in court. They just file do their thing, and it, you know, staves off the, the eviction process. At least one judge thinks it's time for Hansbill to go. I think it was time, a long time to go. The history of this case going on for approximately 20 years must come to an end, Nassau District Judge Scott Fairgreave wrote in a December 2019 housing court proceeding. Diamond Ridge has spent $150,000 on legal fees and paid $50,000 in property taxes since purchasing the home. What did they pay for the home? Two hundred grand in? They're looking at this thing going, oh, man, I knew we shouldn't have bought this one. It looked like such a good deal. We're going to make some money because it was, you know, it's a distressed property. And we all know that you can make a lot of money in distressed properties. Not this one. We need this one gone. Will you take 20 grand to get out? So 150 grand, 50 grand in property taxes since purchasing the home, said member uh, of Diamond Ridge, uh, Max Sold. That's a great name for somebody in uh, real estate. Max Sold. My name's Max Sold. You should buy this home. My name is Max Sold. I sold this home. I don't know. Uh, who added that as of this writing, we still have no known end in sight. This litigation is ongoing. It's just, it, it, it's, it's endless. This is a crazy endless story. The pandemic may give Hansbell yet another reprieve. The pandemic, the Rona. You can't evict me. You might get the Rona. You can't evict me. Uh, noted Katz, who said the COVID-19 backlog in New York's housing courts has kept them from pursuing their eviction effort. Plus, there's an eviction moratorium. But most uh, lenders and courts that I know of, if you had this claim going in before the coronavirus, the courts will allow you to evict. But you know what? With all this stuff just kind of running around going on, kind of like all bets are off. You, you just don't know what's going to happen. So I can't tell you how many brokers I've had who have said, hey, we." I had this conversation um, just this past week. Hey, we've got squatters in the backyard. We just had a transfer of sale on this home. So my broker would have either you know, represented the buyer or the seller. If they're the buyer, they're like, hey, uh, yeah, we closed on this house, but there's these people living in the backyard and uh, they're just squatting and you're my managing broker. So what do I do? You know, not, not exactly like that, but you know, along those lines. And oftentimes it's, uh, yeah, we called the police and they said, because of the Rona, we can't do anything. I'm like, yeah, it's called uh, an eviction moratorium. And uh, anybody who kind of wants to stay in place right now can do so basically forever until these eviction moratoriums get lifted. And there's always the long pause. And then usually it's like, really? Like, yeah. There's this podcast you should listen to. It's called the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. And they kind of talk about that topic fairly often. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, how do I get the people out of my out of the backyard of my client's new house? Um, yeah, good luck with that. Really hard era of the Rona doesn't matter what your ownership is. If you're in, you're in in like Flynn. That's always the term I heard. I never really understood what that reference was. But that's one of those weird sayings you have in your head from, you know, your mentors when you're young in like Flynn. What does that mean? I don't know. Still don't. But now I'm talking about it on a podcast, right? All right, let's finish this one out. So Hansball did not return messages from the author of this article. 
shocking, right? A woman who answered the bell at Kentmore Street and identified herself as a tenant said Hans Ball was not at the home. Oh, uh, he's not home. He's not here. He does live here. Are you from the bankruptcy court? He does live here. Are you from the... No, he's not here. Um, which featured at least three cars without license plates in the driveway. We've got shenanigans going on in this home. So here, it, before we close out, here's another angle. He's probably been charging people rent by the bedroom this whole time. So say, so say he's getting a couple of grand, a, uh, he's getting a couple of grand a month, maybe from renting out. How many bedrooms is it? Is it a three? I can't remember. Probably three, two and a half, I think. Uh, so let's just say he's renting out a couple of, maybe he's getting a grand. Okay. A grand times how many months? Yeah, you got it. 20 years times 20 times 12. Oh, so he could, he could have saved in or made way over half a million dollars when this is all said and done and by not paying and then, you know, having positive cash flow because he's charging, but not doing anything else. Did he pay any taxes? Probably not. Has he done any maintenance? Probably just enough to keep it together, but he knows he's going to lose it eventually. So why would you dump a bunch of money in? You wouldn't. You would just make sure the roof is on. You know, maybe who knows what he's done maintenance wise, but this guy has really worked the system. So if you ever kind of wonder to yourself, I wonder how long I could stay in here before getting booted out. The answer is if you really work it, probably over 20 years, but let's cut that down to 10. Because I think a lot of the stuff that is in play here happened during the Great Recession, you know, up until halfway through the Great Recession, you've got lenders going out of business. You don't have that today. Things are more managed today and lenders have got things more dialed in. Um, and that's why these mortgages are able to be sold as, you know, mortgage backed securities. Um, you've got that going on. Whereas back then people are like, oh, you've got this asset this asset that hasn't been had a payment on it bundled up and these other asset bundles. And, you know, some of this stuff is kind of junky looking. We're still getting good returns, but it's a little junky looking. We don't have that as much anymore. They don't package these things up. You know, you don't have the, you don't have that going on as much. So, and uh, lending criteria is different. You actually have to have an income and you have to have money in the bank to make this work. You've got to have down payments. So this guy probably got in with like virtually nothing down when he bought it, made one payment, still there 20 something years later. That's wild. I mean, that's just, that's a crazy story, but it's out there. So if the moral of the story is crime does pay, life is too short. Don't live your life like this guy. Don't, don't do a personal test to see how long you can go without making a mortgage payment. That's not the way to go. Make your payments. You sign a contract, fulfill your contract, honor your contract, personal responsibility. Don't be this guy. Although 20 years, that's impressive. I might hats off to him, but then again, man, mm, no crazy, right? Okay. That's it for me. On this one, I, it's it's a little bit of a weird story because it's like 20, how does somebody get away with that? Well, you just heard, but would I recommend it? No, absolutely not. Why not? We're reasonable people. We deal with reasonable topics, topics here in the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. So that's it for me on this one. Thank you so much for being here. I'll catch up with you guys. Until then, stay safe. See you in the next one. Till then, bye. to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.